why did the mob put a contract out on this star? Find out. Call 1-800-626-7777 now and order the companion book to this historic program. Only $19.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. Or look for it in your favorite bookstore. We now return to Loyalty and Betrayal, the story of the American mob. Like a guest who stays too long, the mob has worn out its welcome. America's fed up. I need a small squad of detectives who will go to work on this job as they never have before. No punishment can be too severe for these public enemies. They deserve the whipping post over us. If criminals were treated as they treat us, crime would cease. Take away their prison luxuries and give them a taste of the rock pile. It's too bad that we even have to pay for their support. Their extermination would be much more satisfactory. It is not my purpose, said Dewey, to prosecute prostitutes and pimps. I want the big shots. I want Luciano, the czar of organized crime in this city. The ambitious prosecutor can't bust Lucky Luciano on anything else, so he finally charges him with white slavery. Dewey comes up with witnesses to support his charge. They say Lucky's the king of pimps. They say he runs prostitution rings. They say his women are paid $25 a week. They say Luciano makes $12 million a year. of 68 women sing the same songs. It's music to Dewey's ears. I heard Lucky say one night, I wouldn't have cared what he accused me of. Let him accuse me of murders or anything else. But to accuse me of white slavery? I... My God, that's the last thing I'd ever want anybody to say that I did. Luciano was not a pimp. He was not running prostitutes. Absolutely true. He was not running prostitutes. He was one of the best customers that Polly Adler and her whorehouse ever had. What he was guilty of was extortion. He was shaking down the pimps. He was shaking down the madams. And all the prostitutes had to kick into a defense fund, so when they were arrested, you used Luciano's lawyers. Uh, you had to get your bail bond from Luciano's people. He was not running the prostitutes and the madams and the pimps. He was shaking them down. Once a month, you take a big envelope full of money and you say, thank you, Lucky, and this is for you. When you push that envelope full of money over there, he has technically violated the White Slavery Act and is guilty. Charlie Lucky Luciano, shackled to his henchman, the overlord of a $12 million a year vice ring, goes to prison for from 30 to 50 years. At Sing Sing, the droopy-eyed gang leader gets his last glimpse of the outside world for many years. When he comes out, he'll be an old man. New York's Big Shot is now just prisoner number 92168. The lowest form of racketeering has been given a death blow, and lucky is lucky no more. the joint is part of doing business in the mob, and it's business as usual. Even in Sing Sing, Luciano still runs the rackets. His mob remains loyal. Lucky's boys just need an idea, a plan, some way to put in a fix and get the boss out. It will take 10 years, but Luciano's luck will pay off eventually.
1937, with the city's most infamous gangster off the streets, Dewey and his gangbusters set their sights on the next hood on the hit parade. For many years, Louis Buckhalter, known as Lepke, has been the worst industrial racketeer in America. Lepke goes into hiding. Lepke wanted, dead or alive. After presses at New York police headquarters roll a million circulars, launching a nationwide search for America's new public enemy number one, Louis Bukalta, alias Lepke, the big city's most feared racketeer. The search leads to what the racket guys call the big heat. It's a crackdown that hurts everybody's business. Suddenly, Lepke doesn't have so many friends anymore. The fugitive Lepke is said to have extorted millions by terrorizing employers and workers. One by one, possible witnesses have been bumped off following his indictment. To beat the rap, Lepke hits upon a simple idea. Kill everyone who can testify against him. For a while, being a possible witness against Lepke is New York's most dangerous occupation. The New York police and federal agents are working together in a nationwide search. The big heat just keeps getting hotter. The search for the racketeer spreads around the country, even to Europe. Meanwhile, Lepke is right under their noses, hiding in Brooklyn, under the protection of Murder Incorporated. This fugitive must be found dead or alive. We went into an Italian restaurant in New York, and it was with Lepke. He was there. They, he was trying to keep from getting executed or something. And we all were having like a farewell dinner, which we hoped wouldn't be a farewell dinner. And at the Italian restaurant, we had a big table spread out, and there was an windows, big windows there. And all of a sudden, a car comes around and starts machine gun in the window, and Doug then yelled, down. And I started, there was a ladies room in back of it. I started slithering on my tummy, and then I went in and I stood up on the, the seat so nobody could see my, my feet. And I just stayed there. I was there long enough to see Ben and the boys tip up the table like that for protection and duck. And then, in a little while, Moe came to the door and he said, Honey, you can come out now. So I came out and I didn't know what I was going to find because most of the wives were and sweethearts were heavier than I was. Some, some of them were big. I don't think they could have crawled like that and slid it in there. But anyway, the table was all reset again, and new anapostles, you know, came out there and were set, and nothing was ever mentioned. Attention, public enemy number one, Lepke Buckholzer. I am authorized by John Edgar Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to guarantee you safe delivery to the FBI. And so I remain your New York correspondent, Walter Winchell. 1939. Lepke's been on the lam for two years. The feds want him for narcotics. Dewey wants him for murder. Mob bosses want the heat turned down. It was time to make a deal. And now I want to tell you about the actual surrender, the actual delivery of public enemy number one, Lepke. The bosses tell Lepke they've got a deal. If he surrenders to Hoover, he will avoid Dewey and the death penalty. Calmness, Walter Winchell becomes the go-between. Taking Lepke by the wrist like a little boy, I said, come on, Lepke. With that, I opened the door of Mr. Hoover's car. As I opened the door of Mr. Hoover's car, I said, Lepke, this is Mr. Hoover. Mr. Hoover, this is Lepke. <laughs> Then came the great double cross. There was no deal. Lefty was turned over to Dewey, convicted of murder, and sentenced to fry in the electric chair. Lefty got right to the point. Walter, I will ask you one thing. Did you ever tell any of my friends that if I came into you for the FBI, that the most I would get would be 10 years? Lefty, I said, I never told that to anybody. In that one second, I saw the eyes of a killer. And then for the first time, he seemed to realize that his own friends had double-crossed him. 
Excitedly, I said, this is Walla Winchell, public enemy number one lefty, just surrendered to the FBI. My editor said, oh, how do you know? How do I know? I just turned him over. He said, oh, you and your silly scoops. Hitler just invaded Danzig. at war. The mob could care less. The boys have got big problems of their own. For the first time, the mob's code of loyalty is about to be challenged. In 1940, the cops pick up murdering hitman Abe Rellis for homicide. He tries to save his own skin by turning informer. Rellis tells the cops about 49 murders in Brooklyn alone. In court, his testimony could easily convict big shots like Ben Siegel and Albert Anastasia. But that never happens. Room 623, the Half Moon Hotel on Coney Island. Prosecutors keep their valuable witness accessible to no one under police guard 24 hours a day Yet, somehow or other, in the early hours of November 12, 1941, Rellis mysteriously falls, or is pushed, out his six-story window. Instead of becoming the first insider to betray the mob, Rellis becomes a warning to other potential informants. As the boys later joked, Rellis was a canary who could sing, but he couldn't fly. Even a squad of cops, a locked room, and the personal guarantee of the DA could not keep Kid Twist alive. Thank you. 